Great. Well, welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where you are. This is our 140th Reading Online Sports Economic Seminar, uh, generously hosted by the University of Navarra, which is where I am visiting Pedro Garcia del Barrio, who many of us uh, will know, uh, regular in the uh, sports economics field. Uh, and we have uh, not presenting for the first time. I wouldn't want to count how many times, Dimitri, but you're always welcome to present. It's great to have you uh, presenting once again, Dimitri Dagaev, uh, with co-authors uh, Dennis Coates, uh, Sofia Pavlina and Pada Pashakov, who presented just a few weeks ago. Uh, and Dimitri is going to present compatriot bias in the evaluation of football players, our experts, our non-experts, subjective. Dimitri, you know that you've got about an hour or so. Uh, take as much or as little as that as you want, and there's plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So, without any further, more, further delay, uh, please do take away your talk. James, thank you for this opportunity to talk about our paper. This is the very first time we present this uh, paper at an international seminar, so we uh, we'll be grateful for your comments, suggestions, and I think that, that there is a lot of work to do. And this is just the very, very first uh, result that I'm going to share with you today. Okay, so this paper is indeed about compatriot bias. Uh, as you know, there is a lot of literature about compatriot bias in sports economics, but in most of the papers, when we are talking about compatriot bias, the decisions are made by experts, that is, referees or uh, committee members, or some other guys who are in power. Today, we will talk about decisions by fans. And can we find a compatriot bias in their decisions? That is a different story. Before we start, I just want to uh, remind some definitions. I checked Cambridge Dictionary about what is uh, favoritism, what is discrimination. And yes, it is an unfair support or uh, vice versa, treating in a worse way some group people or some person uh, by someone who is in authority. Uh, okay, there is a lot of economics literature about some biases, some biased behavior, and for example, there is biased behavior at the Eurovision Song Contest where fans and referees uh, take into account uh, geography and uh, the geographical proximity is a major fact that has an effect on the voting outcome. Uh, in uh, small claim courts in Israel, in-group bias is also present and uh, systematically consistent. Uh, as soon as academic uh, world is concerned in promotion committees, uh, there are some gender biases, and of course, in each of these cases, this bias uh, uh, is not so welcome because some groups of people uh, are treated uh, in a different way. Yes, in sports, there are also some cases where groups of players, groups of athletes are treated differently. Uh, you know some classic papers, the paper by Price and Wolfers uh, about uh, the National Basketball Association where referees uh, issued more calls against the players of the opposite skin color. Uh, you know the paper by Alex Krumer and his co-authors Otto and Pavlovsky. Uh, and they identified that in ski jumping, judges assign higher scores to their compatriots. And of course, this is also an undesired behavior. Uh, I can't miss a chance to talk about uh, the paper that was recently accepted to Journal of Sports Economics by Dagaev, Paklina, Reed and Singleton. Uh, they identified that in 
2000 zeros football referees from post-communist states, favored teams from non-communist states, but there were there was no evidence of favoritism in the opposite direction, and this is an example of outgroup bias, uh, kind of unique bias, because in most cases in-group bias uh, take place. Take place. Okay. So uh, there are two dimensions of this discrimination: the individual discrimination and the collective discrimination, and. Uh, there are also two major uh, groups of decision makers, experts and non-experts. When I say experts, I mean referees, committee members. And uh, it is assumed by the fact that they have this occupation that they are neutral and probably they can be trained to reduce this bias. Uh, as soon as the National Basketball Association is concerned, uh, this uh, organization introduced some special seminars in order to reduce the bias found by Price and Wolfers. And eight years later, they jointly with Pope uh, made a new uh, research and uh, they found that the Mm, referee's bias is no longer uh, present. Okay. And when we talk about decisions by non experts, let's say fans, citizens, uh, they do not, uh, on, on the one hand, they do not make decisions that affect athletes directly. For example, they do not make decisions that, uh, for example, uh, affect their careers, uh, say promotion or something else. But at the same time, uh, the decisions by non-experts are still important because they just affect the atmosphere around the stadium, uh, the atmosphere uh, in the sports industry in general. And uh, their decisions may be challenged by some historical experience and in order to tackle uh, these biases only some major programs can be introduced uh, in order to change the things in a better way okay so in both cases identification of those biases is important because when you are aware of the bias can just uh, implement some programs that can deal with this bias. Okay. So in this paper, we will talk about uh, the bias made by sports fans who are following the uh, famous EA Sports FIFA video game. Uh, starting from the next year, it is no longer a FIFA video game, by the way, uh, it is now called FC and uh, it will be like FC 24 and so on. And uh, this game incorporates the estimates of player skills, the estimates by experts, by the EA sports experts and the estimates uh, by sports fans who come at the special platform and post their marks and their comments under the profiles of the football players. So here is how the card of a football player in this game looks like. Uh, here is Huicha Kvratzhelia. He has several uh, parameters like defense, um, physical condition and so on. And the aggregate score, uh, for example, in FIFA 20, Three, it was 74 for Kvratzhelia and in um, 24 it will be 86. So this we will refer to this score as to the rating of a player, a general rating of the player. Okay. 
so fifa.com is a web platform where EA Sports collects those crowdsourced uh, estimates of players' skills, and that's how uh, this works. So first, uh, there are more than 9,000 uh, members uh, of this community uh, on SoFIFA.com, and they put their marks about players' uh, skills, and also they uh, post some comments, and those comments are also taken into account by the uh, experts, EA Sports experts, when they aggregate all those crowdsourced estimates. So there are more than 300 editors who deal with these scores. So this is indeed a kind of aggregate estimate, but we will be interested only in the crowdsourced estimate. Okay, so we will not learn how editors deal with these scores. We will just analyze the scores posted by the sports fans. OK, uh, this is an example how the profile on the SoFIFA.com looks like. This is Daniel Noel drink water. And uh, you can see that there are many different parameters here and his position and his age, his anthropometric uh, conditions, his transfer market value, his wage and so on. And uh, these are the examples of comments under his profile or someone else profile. Uh, there are some uh, decent comments, some strange comments. So there are different comments there. And we will deal with the sentiment in those comments. OK, uh, we collected the database of the comments posted on the SoFIFA.com under the cards of every football player. Here you can see the distribution of the number of comments uh, across uh, different players. The SoFIFA.com. There are two players who have more than 5,000 comments there. Guess who? Uh, obviously, it's Messi and Ronaldo. But the majority of players have not more than 500 comments. In general, in total, uh, 551 players on SoFIFA.com has at least have at least one comment, and it means that the majority of football players they just don't get comments from sports fans okay so in our database there will be just 551 different football players but at the same time they in total they have more than 70,000 comments under their profiles okay now some descriptive statistics uh, here you can see the distribution of comments across different seasons. So FIFA.com became more and more popular. Uh, and the last year in our database, uh, it's 2020. And in that season, uh, there were there were almost 47,000 comments uh, in our database. OK. Uh, good. Now I would like to say a couple of uh, words about our methodology. So we will evaluate the sentiment of each comment. In order to do that, we use uh, so-called bidirectional encoder representation for transformer model, uh, or shortly BERT. It was developed by Google Research in 2018 and later it was trained on English Wikipedia, which contains 
uh, more than two billion words and also books corpus consisting of more than 800 million words uh, what BERT uh, uh, does, it evaluates the sentiment of each sentence separately, and then each comment consists of several sentences. So we uh, take an average of uh, the sentiment of each sentence in that comment, and then we get this variable, which we'll, we'll call mean sentiment, it's just the average of all sentiments in one comment, okay? And later we will compare the attitude by the fan uh, to the players from his own country and to the players from other countries. So, uh, in order to do that, we need to learn their nation and we use IP addresses of the commenters as a proxy for their nationalities. Uh, this is probably the best uh, what we can do because uh, there is no such information in the profiles of fans. Uh, we don't know the nationality directly, but uh, we will show that this approximation works fine. Uh, finally, when we will get some empirical results, we will also uh, try to explain those results using some theoretical model in the hoteling downsound framework to explain those results. Okay. Uh, on this slide, you can see some examples how BERT works. Uh, there are different sentences here, and uh, in red, you have the estimates by BERT of the sentiment in these sentences. For example, when you have Messi is not a good player, BERT assigns a score of one to this sentence. When you have Messi is a good player, Bert assigns the score of five. For some neutral comments like lol, uh, Bert assigns the neutral mark of three. Um, also, there are some intermediate examples. And these are real uh, estimates from our data set. So you can see that BERT is quite impressive in identifying good and not so good uh, attitude in the comments. Okay. Uh, this is the list of variables that we use in our paper. So we are interested in the number of comments under the player's profile. We are also interested in the number of comments posted by a single user. Mean sentiment, as I already said, is a sentiment of a separate comment, and it is an average of sentiments in all sentences in this comment. Uh, we call a comment positive if Bert assigned a score of four of, or five to that comment. Uh, we call the player a compatriot of the fan if the author of a comment is a compatriot of that player. Okay. Also, we will use the age of the player in our data set, the rating, the overall rating of the player, and the transfer market value of the player in million euros. Okay. Uh, some more descriptive statistics. We have 75,000 observations in our data set. And uh, when I say observation, I mean a comment. So we have 75,000 comments. 
the average sentiment is close to three and all sentiments are there. OK, uh, most of the comments are positive. And not so many uh, comments were written by compatriots, only 12% uh, of them. OK. Uh, there were nearly 6,000 commenters who posted comments on SoFIFA.com and the average number of comments by a single commenter is close to 13. Okay, the most productive commenter left nearly 1,600 uh, comments there. Okay. Uh, what about players? Uh, so this statistics is on the player season level, so his age, his transfer market value can change. Uh, you can see that the average age here is close to 23. The average score, the average rating is like 75 and um, some other statistics. Okay, now our empirical strategy. So first we consider the linear model and we estimate it using the ordinary least squares method, where on the left side we have the mean sentiment of a comment, yeah, which uh, uh, was left to player I by commenter J. Uh, yes, and on the right side we have uh, the compatriot dummy, the number of comments, the transfer market value, the rating of a player, the age of the player, and also we take into account fixed effects on players and commenters. Okay, and here are the first results. So what we can see. If we consider the first model, the very first model, when there is no interaction uh, between popularity of a player and uh, the compatriot variable, the compat there is no compatriot bias. This variable not significant. However, when we added uh, this interaction with popularity, suddenly we got statistically significant results. So the overall effect depends on the number of comments. If the number of comments is large, then the overall effect can be negative. So for uh, popular players, the compatriot bias is negative. And this is honestly surprising for us. Uh, for not so popular players, when the number of comments is close to zero, then this effect dominates and the compatriot bias is positive. So this result is uh, very robust in different specifications that we considered. Uh, and uh, this is interesting, so we, we should really think about that. The age of the player doesn't matter. There is no statistically significant uh, effects here. The rating of a player uh, leads to lower sentiment, so more strong players uh, get lower sentiment given all else equal. Uh, the transfer market value also uh, decreases the average sentiment of the comment. So it seems that the, that the stronger the player is, the lower is the sentiment that he gets. This is surprising probably. Okay. Uh, the number of comments that the user leaves under the profiles on so FIFA.com also has a statistically significant uh, impact on the average sentiment, you see that 
uh, active users leave uh, lower uh, sentiments, leave comments with lower sentiments on the website. OK. So this is the summary of the first model. Yes, popular players get lower sentiment. Uh, better players get lower sentiment. Without interaction with popularity, uh, there is no statistically significant compatriot bias. But if the interaction is taken into account, it was included in all models except the first one, there is a statistically significant compatriot bias. However, it is lower for more popular players and the sign of the bias depends on the number of comments, on the popularity of the player. Uh, we also uh, included in one of the models the uh, position of the uh, player and it seems that in general uh, attacking players get higher evaluations by the fans but at the same time when you look at the compatriot bias and when you look at the interaction with the compatriot there is no statistically significant result there okay uh sorry good uh this figure provides an interesting observation that uh, the value of the compatriot bias is different across different countries. For example, in Great Britain, this compatriot bias is negative. Uh, at the same time, in Spain, it is positive. So it seems that the compatriot bias varies across different countries. Okay. Now, another idea that uh, we uh, check in this paper is that probably we can redefine the notion of a compatriot. For example, if you consider Quincy Promes, who is currently playing for Spartak Moscow, uh, his compatriot uh, of the Dutch funds uh, in the previous model, but what if he can be considered as a compatriot for Russian commenters since he is playing for the club that represents the Russian Premier League. And therefore, we redefined the notion of a compatriot. Now, the compatriot is a player who plays in the domestic league uh, for the corresponding fan. Yes. And we checked the same regression, the same linear regression, and here are the results. Uh, as you can see here, the results are very similar. So once again, the, the, the there is no compatriot bias without uh, the corresponding interaction, yes? But when the interaction is included, then once again you get this compatriot bias. And if the player is popular, really popular, then the compatriot bias has a negative sign. If uh, the player is not so popular, the sign is positive. All other results are also similar, so I won't discuss them in detail. So, one of the arguments against this approach is that probably the fact that nowadays many users use VPN protocols in order to access internet websites uh, that are blocked in their respective countries. Uh, probably this fact can affect our results. So we decided to check uh, the correlation between 
popularity of VPN protocols in the country and the number of search and, and the number of comments posted by the users from that country in our data set. And it seems that this correlation is not statistically significant. So it is not true that the majority of uh, comments in our database are from the countries where uh, there is a limited access to internet and where users are forced to use uh, VPN servers in order to access to the blocked uh, websites. So uh, since there is no such correlation, we uh, make an, assum an assumption that this um, VPN story has no serious um, effect, uh, impact on our result. OK. So in our models, we got that uh, popular players have lower compatriot bias compared to unpopular players. And the question is, what is the driving force of this effect? Because you know that when you are talking about, let's say, Messi, it seems that such players as Messi, they have many fans and why they just uh, get lower scores from their compatriots. In order to explain this effect, we decided to... Uh, look into the structure of preferences of the sports fans. It seems that nowadays there are many so-called anti-brand communities in social networks. For example, if you are rooting for Christian Ronaldo, you may hate Messi and indeed there are many anti-Messi communities on Facebook and anti-Ronaldo communities on Facebook. And this is a, re a recent phenomena, the spread of these anti-brand communities. And those communities are not widespread, not only in football, but also in business and industry uh, as well. And uh, probably that can explain this story. Uh, let's check. Uh, let's check whether it is possible to rationalize the fans' behavior and to provide an example of their preferences, such that uh, more popular players get lower uh, scores from the competitors. So, in order to do that, we built. Uh, the model in the hoteling downsen framework assume that we have two linear countries, country A and country B. Uh, here we have country A from 0 to 1 on this x-axis and country B a little bit to the north of country A, yes, but also from 0 to 1. OK, uh, and football fans in country A are living here. They are distributed for the simplicity. They are distributed uniformly on this uh, interval. And also in country B, they are distributed uniformly. And then you can introduce the preferences of sports fans over the set of all possible locations where a football club can appear, can be established, yes? So if you consider some point on this plane, uh, and if you consider another point, the fan will probably root for the football club that is closer to his point. Uh, this uh, reflects the territorial story in football because it seems that many fans are rooting for teams from their own cities. Yes, if you live, for example, 
in uh, Barcelona, then you are rooting for the team from Barcelona. If you are living in Madrid, then you are rooting uh, for a team from Madrid. And this is the assumption that uh, we introduced here that the fans have Euclidean preferences, that is, uh, given any two points, they will choose the club that is closer to their own uh, home on this plane. Okay. Um, so the preferences are introduced, they are Euclidean. Okay. And now assume that each citizen is a fan of exactly one club. So it is not possible to root for several clubs in this model. Uh, if now the set of all clubs is fixed, then all funds will be split into so-called fan communities. So for each fan, it is possible to derive for which club he is rooting for according to his preferences. And for example, if you have those two countries and the fans are living only in those two countries, and if you have club A1 uh, in country A and club A2 in country A, as well as club B1 in country B and club B2 in country B, then if it is possible to, to choose a club only from your own country, then, for example, in country A, club A1 is more popular because uh, that club is located closer to the median point of that country compared to club A2. In country B, clubs B1 and B2 are equally popular because they are symmetric uh, with respect to the median point on that interval. And the fan communities are colored in the respective colors here. For example, in red, we have the fan community of club A1 in country A, and in green, we have the fan community of club A2 in country A. Okay, so if it is allowed to uh, root for the club in your own country only, then we have this uh, picture. Okay, now we can say we can compare the popularity of football clubs. For example, in country A, the community of club A1 is larger compared to the community of club A2. So we will say that club A1 is more popular. Okay. And the next step now. What about the situation when you are allowed to be a fan of a club from uh, another country? For example, Consider once again country A. There are two clubs here, club A1 and club A2. And club A1 is more popular in country A compared to club A2 because it is located closer to the main point and maybe even uh, to the right of that point. Okay, So it is more popular in country A. And now assume that Football club B1 is established now and B1 is from another country and the fans from country A now can choose between clubs A1, A2 and also B1. So let's see how the fan communities will change in that case. Uh, the fan community of club A1 in this particular example, when club B1 is to the northwest of club A1. So the fan community of club A1 will be separated because some of the fans who are closer to this zero point 
will switch from routing for club A1 to routing for club B1 because B1 is closer to them. For example, for zero for, for the fan who is living in the zero, uh, club B1 is closer than club A1. So club A1 will lose some share of fans when club B1 appears here. And when we consider club A2, the fan community of club A2, we'll see that no fan from this fan community will switch to club B1. Because for all of them, uh, point A2 is just closer than point B1. And this is an example of a situation when international competition leads to the situation when more popular clubs suffer to the higher extent from this competition compared to less popular clubs. And if the competitor bias is just the difference in fan communities of national and foreign clubs in the particular country, then uh, this competitor bias is reduced for more popular clubs in this particular example. Of course, the things can be different if a foreign club appears somewhere uh, closer to point A2, yes? But this is just an example how rational fans with rational preferences uh, can have, uh, can express lower competitor bias for popular clubs compared to unpopular clubs. So the geographical story can be one of the explanations of that empirical result that we got in the previous uh, model that we discussed earlier. OK, so it seems that these are the main results that we got up to this point. And uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dimitri. Very interesting talk on compatriot bias. And also going to give you five, you know, the, uh, the reaction and a round of applause. So thank you very much. Um, um, we've got plenty of time for questions and comments. So if anyone in the audience has any questions or comments for Dimitri, please do go ahead. Please raise your hand or just simply ask your question. Georgi. Yes, hi, um, Dimitri. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, it's a great topic indeed. Um, I have a couple of questions, as a matter of fact. So um, one of the questions, and let's stick with your example uh, of Quincy Promes. He recently played a great game in the Russian Cup, participated in all three goals. So um, for a player unst as unstable as him, and I'm sure there are many unstable players whose performance as well as potential, so the algorithm would rate the potential different based on current performance. So if something like that occurs, have you considered um, analyzing of uh, sort of the commenter sentiment as a time varying profile? Because if Quincy played a bad game, I'm sure if he were a more popular player, a lot of people would jump on the uh, on the on the page, comment a lot of negative things. He's a joke. You know, he should leave Spartak. But for instance, if he plays a great game, all of a sudden the sentiment is switched and, you know, sort of uh, you're running Bert and all of a sudden he's getting fours and fives as opposed to, you know, ones and twos in some other period. Yep, thank you. Uh, well, this is indeed a very interesting story. We had an idea to check the sentiment after, for example, crucial misses uh, in a match, for example, after missing a penalty or after uh, missing some obvious goal scoring opportunity. 
but we didn't do that by this point and it seems that uh, our our suggestion is that uh, indeed there could be a peak of comments after such uh, bad misses but we didn't do that uh, up to now but we will try to take it into account thank you for this idea yep thank you um I have another one unless uh, someone else has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, what about the people? Because I'm quickly, I'm very new to this website, but you know, I've pulled it up on my other screen uh, while you were presenting. And um, it seems to be that you can deliberately hide your nationality. You, you can deliberately be like a new, as neutral as possible. So some of these commenters, they only have their favorite uh, home clubs. Some of them have, uh, you, you know, uh, flags of various countries. Some of them have neither and, and still comment. Um, so, um, you know, that is something that have you considered having that as a pure control group? What is like the purely controlled sentiment of people who, you know, deliberately do not disclose their nationality as not uh, as if not to elicit bias, for instance. Thank you, Georgi. An excellent point. Well, first of all, we uh, to, uh, we took their the country of their IP address as a nationality, and we have IP addresses for all comments in our data set. Uh, so this is not about the information in their uh, profiles. But at the same time, you are absolutely right that if we consider two different groups of commenters, the first group who uh, have some information about their nationality, let's say their favorite club or their hometown or something else, and the second group, uh, the commenters that didn't post any information there, then uh, we probably can derive some implications. But uh, the problem is that we cannot check how sincere they are in providing this information in their profiles. So how to interpret those results that, that those results? It seems that IP address is more objective, surprisingly in this sense, because it is difficult to hide it unless you use uh, VPN uh, protocol. But we deal with those VPN stories in a different way. Great, thanks, Yogi. Stefan. Uh, uh, hi, Dimitri. Um, that's a um, very interesting um, topic. I, I, have, I have one suggestion for, for when you talk about um, you, when you looked at the players who were playing for clubs in a given country, although they weren't nationals, and you called them compatriots as well. I think I would use the word mercenary in that case. Uh, to distinguish. It's a, diff it's a different case. In, uh, uh, and, and it's a very interesting question about whether how people feel about those individuals. And sometimes it can be very, very positive and sometimes very negative. Um, I suppose my feeling is that, that, that um, nationality is one dimension on which people might have biases. But I guess there's quite a lot of other dimensions. And that's kind of what I'm worried about here is that um, for example, you know, the one that sticks out to me um, is obviously race, where um, I, I, whether it, it, I would think, actually, I would think that's probably in many cases a far more important determinant of attitude than actually nationality. Um, you can think of ethnicity, you might even go so far as religion in some cases, these things can, can all play a significant role. And I think um, the danger is that with your nationality variable, you're actually capturing, you know, you're you're capturing many many other other factors that are going on. The other thing I was struck me was that um, your assessment is based entirely on 
their playing characteristics. Whereas um, I think of it, in many cases, it's not necessarily so much to do with their abilities as players. So I get, again, a, a, the great good example right now is would be Vinicius Junior, right? Who um, is a spectacularly good player and very popular all of Real Madrid fans. Uh, but then uh, after the racist chanting incident, when he publicly accuses the Spanish FA of doing nothing about racism in Spain, now suddenly he's uh, he's become a target and a lot of people in Spain hate him. Um, and he has a pretty rough time of it. And so that's got nothing to do with his footballing ability, nothing to do with what, what, what his play, and it's all to do with attitude. These, that's an extreme example, but these individuals are you know these are celebrities they're not just athletes right so because they're celebrities in many cases, and then the, the final thing i want to say is i think one thing you might want to look at is um um thomas peter's paper about uh wisdom of the crowds which is a really excellent paper and he so and of course uh he used transfer marked um data and that's of course those are valuations produced by club forums um, with so individuals actually expressing an opinion on the value of the players and he looked to see whether those evaluations were um, generated any bias so he took to the, the the valuations of the players at the club level and then applied those valuations to the performance of the national teams and saw whether they were accurate predictors of national team performance and it turned out they were extremely accurate predictors of, of national performance, and not only that, but there was um, there was there was no evidences of biases in favour of, 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 of in, the, in, in the data. So um, he, he checked for that. So you might want to look at that and see and compare that with his approach. Hi, Stefan. Thank you so much for uh, your useful comments. Well, I totally agree with you about uh, some other important uh, sources of the biases, including the racial bias. And honestly, this is the next thing we are going to check because we have some soft that can distinguish uh, the color of the skin uh, on the picture and we will probably integrate this information in our uh, models and this will be just the next step uh, in our uh, paper as for celebrities and uh, this story well uh, the only idea i have now uh, is that we can probably think about the number of uh, followers on some social networks, let's say an Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter and uh, so on. And probably this will also give uh, us some information about how the fans um, uh, deal with the popularity of the players. So probably Popularity can be measured not only by the number of comments on the so FIFA, but also on the number of comments on Twitter. Yes, totally agree, but it, it will be difficult, but uh, we will try to uh, estimate uh, this non-football popularity. Uh, okay, and thank you uh, so much for referring us to Thomas Peters' uh, paper. We'll definitely check once again this paper and uh, we'll try to uh, take some useful techniques from there. Thank you. Great, thanks, Stefan. Um, before Alex asks this question, Dimitri, do you think you could unshare your screen? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, just a question. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alex. Hi, thank you very much. Very nice presentation and good to see you. Um, so, regarding this uh, popular players, I think I. I, I I think I discussed it with uh, Peter, but I'm not sure about it. Uh, maybe it's the point that you have this uh, negative, uh, right, negative bias against popular players. 
So maybe what happens is this simply fans of within the same country, they just uh, they just uh, don't support these players. Like uh, fans of CSKA, maybe they say something badly about uh, uh, players of Spartak, for example. So that's kind of the mechanism. Yep, Alex, I totally agree with you. Thank you. And the basic idea of this anti-brand community is just about this fact that if you have two clubs close to each other uh, mm. in Downsian model, then uh, half of the clubs will, half of the fans will root for one club and half of the fans will root for another club. And if the preferences are structured in such a way that just the, uh, those uh, another hub club hates your club not just roots for another club then indeed this effect takes place so probably we have to separate the neutral uh, relation with a club and the hate uh, the hate relation uh, with that club because it can uh, indeed uh, lead to this result where popular players or popular clubs get higher attention and get higher hate from uh, other players. But I guess I guess it's not only the, that half of the clubs or half of the people will support. Let's say in Russia, either you support Zenit or you just hate it. And I guess there are more hate, more people that hate Zenit than support, I guess. Or the same about Spartak Moscow. So within the model, I guess there are no, for some clubs, there are no real neutral fans. Uh, I, I, I have to think about that. Alex, thank you. And uh, if you don't mind, I, I will just uh, reach you after the seminar with uh, no problem. Uh, these ideas. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Any more questions and comments for Dimitri? Georgi again. Yeah, uh, so just a quick thing, quickly looking at, because um, I remember you said and something like an LOL would be a neutral comment from Burr's perspective. Now, here's an anecdotal example. And again, I, I think, you know, by and large, um, it should average down, but um, I'm looking at the page of Mihail Mudrik, who is not has not lived up to his potential in Chelsea yet. And five days ago, there's a comment that says 21 games, zero goals, two assists. Then there's a reply saying they paid 50 mil for each assist. And then another person comments LOL to it, which at least to me, and again, uh, AI is probably better at, at analyzing such things, but this LOL is closer to one than it is to a three. So uh, what do you think of this uh, inference method as a whole? Uh, Georgi, thank you. Uh, indeed, this is an important story, but for us, this method is a black box. So we cannot change uh, the algorithms inside this black box, yes? Uh, we are forced to take uh, this bird model as is and uh, i understand that there can happen some situations and probably you described one of those situations when uh, the comments are interpreted not in the same way as the humans would interpret those comments but at the same time i don't see a major problem in just omitting the comment like LOL because, uh, well, it it doesn't introduce some major noise. So it is not a positive uh, mark for a comment that was assumed to be negative by a player. Yes. So in this situation, the BERT model just says, just skip this comment. I will not, uh, I will put a neutral mark uh, for that comment. So probably this is not the uh, 
large mistake uh, by this model and unfortunately we have to deal with that but in general well i glanced over the uh, dozens of those comments and dozens of those marks uh, by Bert, and I must say that I agree with the vast majority of uh, them. Great, thanks, Georgi. Any more questions and comments? Well, let me say thank you to all who participated in this discussion, because for us, your contribution, your ideas and your thoughts are really important in the next stages of this uh, research. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. Uh, thank you to your co-authors as well. Uh, and uh, so we'll, uh, we'll wrap up for this week. Thanks, Dimitri, for your talk. We're not going to meet next week. Next week is the Research and Economics Using Sports Data Workshop in Vienna. And to all who are there, wish you a productive time and a pleasant stay in Vienna. We'll return on October the 6th with Matteo Piccio of Marsh Polytechnic University presenting the impact of high temperatures on performance in work-related activities. So thanks, everyone. And see you next See you. Bye-bye. Cheers, Dimitri. Bye.